Yeah. Welcome, welcome to another exciting episode of Meet the Author here on a Monday, kicking off your week with some love and some good information. I hope everybody's feeling well. I see everybody's popping into our our chat room. Lots of good guests today. Oh, you guys are going to have fun in the chat room today. There's a lot of good people coming today. So make sure you get to know each other as best you can. Here comes Harriet. I see her coming in. You got to get to know her. Uh, some quick announcements. First of all, I'll introduce myself because Harriet's here and she'll yell at me if I don't. So I am Teresa Hummel Crowlinger. I have been hosting Meet the Author for just about nine years. This is craziness that it's been this long. We do some nice in-person programs at the Pyramid Club, and we also do some nice virtual programs here on Zoom. So let's talk about some upcoming programs that we have. We have uh, a women's panel in Philadelphia on May 3rd. You, If you are in the Philly area or a train ride away, you want to come to this. This is Wednesday night at 6 p.m., and the link is out in the chat room. You should register. You should come. We're going to have a nice crowd there. May, or June 1st, David Newman. So David Newman has been a guest on Meet the Author a couple times because he has two other books, but he is going to be uh, talking about his new book, Do It Selling. And let's face it, we're all in sales, right? Whether you have your own company or you're inside a company and you're just trying to get people to buy your idea, you want to join us for David Newman on June 1st. That's in person at the Pyramid Club. July 20th, we have Mark Hirschberg, who has a career toolkit. He will be a virtual program on July 20th. And then September 26th, we don't have the registration up yet, but I want you to mark your calendar for that evening. We're going to have a Philadelphia author panel. These folks have all written books about our fair city. And we have really wonderful people come in. In fact, one of the Strawbridges, those of you that are old enough to remember Strawbridge and Clothier in Philadelphia, one of the Strawbridges is going to join us with her book that she just published about Strawbridge and Clothier. So that's coming up. Also want to put a plug in on HR Person of the Year celebration at Live Casino on May 18th at 6 p.m. Why do you want to go? because I am one of the finalists for HR Person of the Year. How crazy is that? That is insane. I was so excited to hear that. So we're gonna have a big party at Live Casino, lots of cool people, good food, drink, and you can play penny slots after the celebration. It doesn't get any better than that. All right, gang, are we ready for our author of the day? Our author of the day. And you, you know, every time I introduce somebody, I've found these folks through someone else that I love and that loves me. So Harriet Stein, my dear friend, she was at an NSA event in Philadelphia. She met Robbie, they got talking and she said, you know what, you need to know Teresa. She introduced us, we hopped on a call. I don't know, I think we were on for like 90 minutes. It was a long call, but he lives 10 minutes from my house. He loves Zoom as much as I love it, maybe more. He has several books, but this is the book we're going to talk about today, the one about Zoom and how to make your virtual presentations good, excellent, wonderful, things people talk about after they've attended, and not something that they snooze through. Are you ready, my friend? Please come to the stage. Robbie Samuels. Everybody, round of applause. <laughs> hey, everybody. So awesome to be here. Thank you to Harriet for introducing me to you. And folks, I'm Robbie Samuels. I use he, him pronouns. And uh, uh, for those who would like a visual description, I am a white guy in my uh, late 40s. And uh, I've got short black hair and um, a salt and pepper beer that I've earned by having two kids and a blue polo, uh, and I'm also wearing wire-framed glasses. So uh, I just wanna take you back a moment to March, 2020. I know for some of us, this is not a good moment. Uh, I had spent over a decade working to be recognized as a networking expert with a particular focus on conferences. My first book is about networking at conferences that came out in 2017. I did a TEDx talk in 2019 
again about networking at conferences. That came out in January of 2020. By then, I also had a podcast. I had written for Harvard Business Review. I had done a group coaching program all around networking. And two months after my TEDx came out, no one, no one needed any of the skills that I had acquired. So I had to find a new way to show up and offer value. So I did uh, host a virtual happy hour on March 13th, 2020. Unbeknownst to me, by about eight or nine months later, I was going to have a thriving six-figure business based on all new revenue streams. And on March 13th, 2023, I launched my third book, Breakout of Boredom, Low-Tech Solutions for Highly Engaging Zoom Events. And so today, I'm going to be sharing with you concepts and strategies from that book, which is really the culmination of everything that I've learned over the last few years about how to design transformational, inclusive, and engaging online experiences. So for starters, I wanted to tell you a little bit of a story. Uh, so I have had the privilege of working with so many uh, wonderful mission-driven organizations with their virtual events over the last three years. And one of them is an organization that hosts a, an event that has as a feature race dialogues. Their intention is to create more of an anti-racist community and to help each individual um, get to that anti-racist identity and action. And so in the afternoon, participants get to choose one of many different Zoom links. So not breakout rooms, but one of many Zoom links based on how they answer the, the US census on race and ethnicity. So what you're seeing on the screen is a list of possible ways to answer the US census regarding race and ethnicity. So about three, a little over 300 of the about 500 to 600 people at the conference identified as white and were choosing that room. So I was in that room during that part to facilitate people getting into breakout rooms. We did breakout rooms of 10 each with a trained facilitator. I trained these facilitators ahead of time, not just on using Zoom, but also how to hold space for these important conversations. They would do a 30 minute call, a 30 minute breakout room. Then we had a second breakout room where people got to choose one of six topics. And again, I put them into rooms, this time with up to 10 people based on a specific topic with a sign facilitator. I just want you to take a moment and think about how that would work in person. <laughs> Can you just think about 300 plus people, 30 plus tables, 30 trained facilitators, people milling about trying to figure out where they're supposed to go. Is that one big ballroom that's super loud and hot? Is it a series of breakout rooms that we have to look, what do we take over an entire like floor of a hotel? How far away would these rooms have to be? Would people be coming late into the sessions because they don't know where they're going? I mean, it, I, I can't actually imagine how this would have pull, been pulled off. And in March, 2020, I had no idea that we could do something of this virtually. And yet now I actually believe that thoughtful, strategic, purpose-first event design and quality online facilitation is what made this possible. So I just want to hold on to the idea that these kinds of transformative events are possible on Zoom much more than we have been doing in the past. And I want to now share with you what our agenda is in the little time that we have. I'm going to talk about purpose-first design, getting ready for the event. So like what I do in the few minutes right before, ready, set, go is going to be quite a few topics around during the event, what we could do to really maximize our time together. I'll be taking questions throughout, but also hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, on the right side of the screen, there is a fireman uh, in a fire outfit, a fireman outfit, holding a fire hose that is blasting at full speed. And I, I have that there because for some of you, this is going to be like drinking from the fire hose. And so I want to suggest to you that you take what you can and don't worry about the rest. Take actionable pieces from this, things that you can use right now. And just know the rest of this is there. Uh, and there's lots of ways for you to follow up with me or read the book, et cetera. And to help you with that throughout this presentation, I'm going to have what I call a pause slide, where I'm going to ask you to jot your takeaways into chat and your questions. And if you have a question, my request is that you write the word question in all caps before whatever your question is in chat, which will make it easier for us to keep an eye on that. And I'll, I'll be looking through chat during these moments where I'm quiet for a moment. And uh, if I miss any, I know the team here with Teresa and Darby will help me uh, not miss any. And then lastly, uh, as far as resources, I'm going to mention various things throughout, and I will try to give you all the links at the end. If there's anything I don't share a link for, just let me know, and I'll share it all at the end. I do that because sometimes writing 
the uh, putting lots of links in chat, I, I've learned is actually a distraction for participants because <laughs> they might go wander off looking at that or just be distracted trying to grab it. Now I wanna do a quick sense of who's in the room. So I'm gonna launch a poll. There are four questions in this poll. So after you answer the first question, please scroll down on the right side and uh, keep going until you see a submit button. And any co-hosts are not able to answer the poll, although you can accidentally close it. So please hands off the controls, my co-hosts. Um, so yeah, take a moment. The first question is, what is your confidence level with Zoom? And there's a 10, one through 10, 10 being most confident. Uh, the second question is, how experienced are you with online facilitation? So again, a one through 10, 10 being most confident. Third question is, how experienced are you with in-person facilitation? I'm sure a number of you here have lots of experience doing in-person facilitation before the pandemic and maybe now again. The last question is asking, what types of virtual events will you be hosting? And so um, the first uh, option is 60 to 90 minute, minute workshops, masterclasses, and trainings. And that's actually the focus of this session. And that's because we can take that and then expand it to lots of other options. But I think that there are some restrictions. If you're only gonna have 60 minutes like I have here, uh, I'm not gonna have you use certain third-party tools that might take some time to train you on. I'm not gonna get into doing lots of uh, annotation, for instance. So there, or we have to kind of operate with a few more restrictions. Um, but I see here, we've got eight of 11, 10 of 11 have responded. It means only one person's asleep. We'll count down five seconds, five, four, three, two, one, I'll wrap it up here. We we'll share the results. Let's see. Uh, this is great. We're seeing a, a skew towards more confidence with Zoom. This has changed quite a bit since three years ago. Uh, online visitation is also skewing a little higher. I'm going to be surprised. I want to see what you find uh, that you're learning from this. Again, lots of people who are very, there's quite a bit of experience in the room for in-person. And there are definitely differences for in-person and virtual facilitation. And then for the last one, I'm happy to see 80% of you eight out of 10 are uh, interested in learning about 60 to 90 minute programs. And uh, we can definitely apply a lot of this also to these half or full day trainings, multi-day conferences, et cetera. My team and I just did a, a four day multi-track uh, virtual conference, for instance. So um, I, I, when it gets to Q and A, we can, we can speak, talk about all of these things. But first, let me just talk to you about purpose first design. This is helpful in so many areas of our life, because if we are meeting, we should stop and wonder why we're meeting, because sometimes a meeting should really just be an email. So, so why are we meeting? So people are coming into this meeting, this event, this gathering, they're coming in thinking one thing, and you want them at the end to be thinking something else. They're coming in feeling one thing, and you might be wanting them to move to feeling something else. And they're coming in doing one thing, and maybe you want them to do something else. Moving them from thinking, feeling, and doing one thing to thinking, feeling, and doing another thing, that's the transformation we're aiming for. So in this instance, what I'm hoping is that I'm going to move you from thinking Zoom fatigue to thinking Zoom intrigue. I want you to go from feeling just not very tech savvy, like this is all above my head, to feeling, oh, I could do that. I'm capable. I want you to go from doing 45 minutes of death by PowerPoint followed by ineffectual Q&A and no moderating chat to intentional engagement. <laughs> so now it's going to be your turn. I want you to think of either a recent past event or maybe an upcoming event where you're speaking or hosting or playing some kind of role. And without hitting enter, I want you to draft into chat using at least two of these thinking, feeling, doing prompts. Take a moment. What are people thinking, feeling, and are doing? And where do you want to move them to? So pick two of those. Think of an event you've had recently or one coming up. And when you draft it in chat, do not hit enter until I tell you to. I'll give you a moment to do that. Are you about 30 seconds? All right, about 10 more seconds. Five, four, three, 
two, one, hit enter. All right, let's see what people came up with here. So uh, this is, I, I'm going to talk about this debrief uh, as an option. It's called my, I call it the waterfall debrief. So, um, right. So thinking about college and probably feeling uh, maybe a little apprehensive about it, Sheila. And then what they walk away is knowing, understanding their steps, right? Um, uh, Lauren Scott, from thinking they can't make changes in their life to knowing how to make those changes, from feeling exhausted to feeling empowered. Lauren, that, that's a wonderful example and so concise. One of the reasons I like this exercise, Lauren, is if you were working with a team, you would want to sit around a table and get this nailed down before you started planning. Because I've been in the room with lots of cooks. <laughs> and I once had a, my boss's boss say, we didn't get any media coverage. I was like, was that a thing I was supposed to be aiming for? Because if so, we would have had a metric of success and I would have had a strategy to get that met. And that I, I created a whole form. And my, my boss and I would create like a plan for the event and we would have her review it. And after that, she could not give me any more feedback about what I didn't do. Got to get on the same page with people. So it's really, really helpful. And I'm seeing from, if this is from, uh, from Amanda, from Sage on the stage to an all participant collaborative experience. Yes, this is wonderful. All right. So what I want you to be thinking about now is I'm going to give you a moment to just like pause and jot down any takeaways uh, in chat. And if you have any questions, put those in chat as well. And so I'll look here again in a moment just to see if there's any questions that are pressing. Uh, I'm gonna aim to answer more the kinds of questions that uh, are clarification questions if they come in now. But this is the next section that we're going to get into. We're going to get into uh, the getting ready section. So there's a few things I do as soon as I get into a meeting. Uh, one of them is I turn on captions. And in this case, I'm not seeing them enabled. <laughs> um, but that's one of the things that you would enable at zoom.us settings. So it's important to update it ahead of time, but then you have to remember to turn it on. Now, good news is that now Zoom has it that any participant can enable this if you have it set, if it's preset available, they can turn it on. So that's one thing I do. Another one is I preset my slides, meaning I have them open. I have my notes figured out under my, under my camera. I'm happen to be using Google Slides. Uh, and so I'm using the presenter view on Google Slides and it's like up near my camera and I have my presentation full screen on my second monitor. So I want to get that all figured out. And then I close as many irrelevant tabs as possible, uh, particularly if you've got an issue with internet uh, concerns, uh, you want to make sure you do that. And then, and only then, do I start letting in the speakers and I keep everyone else in the waiting room. I am a fan of disabling the waiting room once we're ready to go. And I'm showing you on the screen how you would do that. Uh, tip is that you do need to have a passcode as well as a waiting room on in order to use this feature. But if you click on that security badge down here at the bottom of the image, um, there's an enable waiting room and uh, you can check that. And then uh, we take the check off basically. And what I equate this as is if you're a teacher and you're getting ready in a classroom, you might teach your students if the classroom door is closed, I'm still getting things ready. Please wait in the hallway. But then when you're ready, you go and you prop the door open and then you wave the students in from the hallway, but you leave the door propped open. Any other student who walks up comes right in. And it's one less thing for me to have to worry about as a, as a, a speaker or as a, a host. The other thing I'd like to do is I make all the speakers co-hosts because they're easier to spot later. And I have the instructions on the top right, um, just explaining the steps of how to do that in the participant window. So if you have questions about that, again, you can take a screenshot or, or uh, ask me later. And I do a quick AV check. Now I've, I have done a fuller trainings where I really talk this through, um, but if you look at this picture, this is actually a Zoom employee. <laughs> uh, I grabbed this as a screenshot of a video she was doing and she was sitting very low on her screen and she didn't look at the camera when she was presenting at all. She was smiling, but she was looking down. And that, like, I'm looking at you, even though I'm not, uh, you can't see me full screen, you're still seeing me and I'm looking at you. 
And so some of the things I go through is making sure that the laptop is high enough. If people are using a laptop, um, talking about centering myself and like sitting on the screen. If I'm using a laptop, like tilting the camera towards me. So I have about two fingers of space above my head. And I think that even as a participant, this is something we should all work to do because at any point we could be invited up on stage. <laughs> and uh, I, as a host, as a, as a producer, I make a call every time whether or not to bring someone on stage. If they don't look camera ready, I will not add them because it doesn't serve them or the audience <laughs> to see someone who's like laying in bed <laughs> with their camera on. So I think if you want your stage moment, be stage ready, even when you're not actually the speaker or the host. I also work with them on lights. It's remember this lights, camera, you, the light source should always be in front of you, then the camera, then you, we don't want a light source behind you or on the side. And then we check their sound. I sometimes have speakers, even professional speakers who come in with some sort of uh, external mic showing, and I can tell that's not what I'm hearing. And I'll say, Hmm, would you mind double? I might be wrong. Would you just double check your audio? Could you go down? And they're like, oh, oh, something changed, you know? So we want to make sure people look and sound good. And then check the polls. So if you're a speaker using someone else's session, uh, someone else's Zoom like I am, one of the things you want to do is make sure you're a co-host and then check polls and make sure everything is good. All right. Last thing I do is I say, is there anything you might want me to share in chat? any contact information, any resources, any websites, any, any links at all, because I could collect that information via a chat before we let everyone else in and then plug it in much like Darby was earlier while um, Teresa was speaking. Take a quick moment, see if there's any questions. And I'm gonna share in chat an answer to a question about how to set up captions. I have a video about that, that you're welcome to watch know that when you click on that link, it is a YouTube video. And so it will start playing immediately. Okay, I see a question from earlier from Sheila about purpose versus design. And she says, so this process will help you hone in on the meeting topic. Often we know the meeting topic, what it hones in on is the metrics of success for that meeting topic. What are the objectives or the goals of that meeting? So when you have that clear, then it's easier to decide things like, you know, should we use this exercise or this exercise? Should we ask this question or this question? Like, you know, how much time should people be in breakout rooms depends on the exercise you're trying to do, that kind of thing. And all that should go back to the outcomes. So a uh, question from Harriet about captions. Once they're enabled and I turn it on for the meeting, people, everyone has to then choose whether or not to see it. They have to opt in by clicking a CC button that will appear on the bottom uh, right of their screen. So uh, it will not be running for everybody. It will automatically be off, uh, but then people can turn it on. The other thing is I turn on captions when I give my coaching clients, I'm a business growth strategist, and I coach my clients and I give them the ability to record and I also turn on the captions, they then get the transcript. And I've heard from many of them, it's much easier to search for keywords from a conversation we had in a transcript to get some language than rewatch an hour long call who's got time to watch those replays. All right, so now we're gonna move on to uh, the next topic. So we're ready to get in there. Uh, and now we're talking about Oh, the welcome remarks. So we really want to pull people in. So there's some of what I'm going to be talking about here is how do we like get people to stop multitasking? Because of course, one of the dangers of virtual is that we are sitting with all of our electronics. So one is, is this really a one-time conversation or does it build on something that has been happening? So, you know, I sort of mentioned the three-year pandemic that we've all been living through. So this is an ongoing conversation about how to get Zoom better. I'm just one of the places you've gone to try to get this information. And you know, for you, it might be as an ongoing conversation in an organization or within an industry. What also might be happening afterwards? You wanna be thinking about that a little bit. You may wanna do group agreements depending on the topic. And I just put a few of the ones I like. Um, if you wanna use group agreements, just Google, and you'll find lots and lots of them. Who's in the room? That's why I launched the poll. 
I wanted to get a sense of who was in the room, your comfort with this information that we were talking about with Zoom. It might be useful to also have people realize their commonalities. Like if they're a little uncomfortable using Zoom, it's nice to know you're not the only one <laughs> feeling that way. And then I really love to share a knowledge gap. You're probably wondering, wait, wait, what, what's a knowledge gap? That is actually a knowledge gap. What I just share with you is a small little example. Your brain was trying to fill it in. Like your brain was like, I think I should know what this is. And it got your brain engaged. So a knowledge gap is something unexpected, unusual, memorable, something that catches people's attentions, makes their brains lean forward a little bit. So earlier I, I shared a story about that organization that hosted an event that was all about um, creating this anti-racist community and how we had these really deep conversations around race and how we got people in and out of breakout rooms. That's not something most people think of, that level of sophistication when it comes to using Zoom. So I, I shared that to kind of get you thinking differently about what's possible. Now, another thing that you might do, uh, some alternatives, is an emotional connection, like why care, why you care, why they care, why we all care. And then lastly, it's what, what is this? Something very simple and clear. I, you know, We're meeting today so I can teach you how to fill out 54, form 54B so you can get reimbursed your travel, right? Like something, I mean, we don't need like a big, exciting story. It's just like, we're here to learn this very specific thing. I'm going to answer the question for Mary Beth in a moment, but this, again, if you jot down any takeaways, what's standing out to you? Put it into chat. So far, you might have learned one or two things, something that you might be able to use going forward. I'd love to see what's resonating with you in chat. And I'm going to answer this question from Mary Beth. What are group agreements? Um, they're often used when there's a sort of a difficult conversation. And it's things like um, people agreeing to take space, make space, um, share basically a sharing the mic concept, or um, kind of an agree to disagree. You know, uh, we're all here to learn. So it's different tenants that you're asking people to agree to for that moment to create a safer uh, experience for all involved. And they really vary. But if you type in group agreements, sometimes they're called group norms. Uh, there's a few different for, uh, wording for them. All right, we're gonna hop into this next section, which is about interactive tools. So for interactive tools, the first one I wanna share with you is the yes, no, nonverbal feedback, which is a setting you need to enable um, if you, if you uh, don't have access to this under your reactions, you can turn it on in your settings. And uh, I would actually love to know if people have used this um, as a speaker. So if you have used this as a speaker, click on the reactions button down here in the bottom right and select the green check mark. Now I'm going to double check that it's here. It's one of the things. Ah, good. Fantastic. Um, so, uh, and if you haven't, click on the reactions button and choose the red X. So on my side, I'm seeing the answers in live time tally on the bottom of the participant window. Any host or co-host sees this. You're also seeing if I stop the slide and we were all in gallery view, but you can kind of see the top of the screen. There are some people who have check marks. Now those check marks will not go away until they are cleared or removed by um, the participant themselves. So I will also tell you the way to remove them is to click on the participant window down here. And then if you're a host or co-host, there'll be an option to clear all feedback and use kind of uh, the waving of the hands optional, but I like to do that. All right, so that's just a nice thing to do because um, you're able to make a in the moment decision to check in and ask a question like, do, do folks want time um, for a breakout room? Uh, do uh, folks want time for a break, I mean, or do we, you know, we want more time on this topic or this topic? So you can do any binary question, yes, no, true, false, like black, white, anything binary like that. Of course, we've got polls only available to paid Zoom, um, but lots of different options for using polls picking different topics, getting comfort, you know, your comfort level now, that kind of thing. What I really want to take a moment to talk about is advanced polls, because there are so many possibilities. And this is probably something most folks are not familiar with. So on the right side of the screen, there's a, a few different options for advanced polls. Advanced polls, again, you need a paid Zoom to have them. You might have matching, which is choosing from column A and column B. Uh, rank order is very interesting, because earlier, 
um, I could list, you know, 10 options and say, what are your top three um, challenges, let's say. There may be a common challenge. There are a lot of people have a certain challenge, but if I ask them to rank their top three, we may wanna focus our time differently because the common challenge may not be the one that is of greatest concern. So we might wanna adjust our time in the meeting differently basing on what's most urgent. And then we have short and long answer and go ahead and, and I saw that question come in, uh, but if you can ask the questions to everyone, I won't miss them. <laughs> um, so short and long answer, you can write your answer right into the poll. This is really cool. And if you've been using Mentimeter or Mural or Miro, uh, this is another thing you can do. And what's nice is that if you use Zoom, you're gonna get between 70 and 90% participation if you use a Zoom poll. <clears throat> but if you use a third-party tool, there's a variety of reasons you may only get 30 to 50 percent of, uh, of people participating. And while they look cool, like is it important to look cool, or are you really looking for this information? Do you need this engagement? And then rate the rating scale is essentially what I did with one through ten, but it's a sliding scale, so it's kind of neat. And then fill in the blank always makes me think about a quiz. And guess what? There are quizzes. The quiz basically means that you also preset the correct answer. So after you show everyone's answers, you then press a little button and you can show the correct answer. That's all very handy. Now, I was not advocating for this early on because when it first came out in fall of 21, we all did not have the minimum requirement to run it, which was 5.8.3 for Zoom. And if you didn't have the updated Zoom, you couldn't even see the advanced poll. So not, not good. Um, Zoom last fall started something called the quarterly minimum update. And so as of last November, we all got bumped to 5.86. Then every three months, they're bumping us to whatever the version was nine months ago. So at this point, we all have the minimum, well beyond the minimum now, of running advanced polls. So I think now we should all be playing with it. Now, you might be wondering if we're automatically being bumped every three months, should I just let it be? I mean, not really, because that means you'll be basically every nine months, you'll get bumped to a nine month ago version. And there's so many new features and security uh, features that are coming as well as engagement features. If Zoom is part of your business, which is why you're here to learn about it, then I would recommend you keep updating. There is a setting in zoom.us settings and on the Zoom app where you can set it to either update slow or fast. Fast is a little less uh, stable. I use fast because I'm always trying to test things out, but I would suggest that you turn that on and it choose slow. And basically what I'll do is I'll prompt you to update your Zoom um, about every few, basically whenever there's a major update, not the little ones in between uh, where they're just making tiny tweaks. So if you don't do that, set a calendar and just maybe at least once a month, update this. Okay, I see some questions coming into chat and some takeaways. I'll give you a moment to write some more. And yes, Harriet, uh, if you're not the one hosting, like I'm not the host of this event, Teresa is, I send my poll questions in advance and I give over time more and more and more detail about how to set them up because I've discovered last minute in those few minutes before the call starts that it was the first time they'd ever set up polls and they were not done right. So um, I have I've sort of specified and since I've done that, they've all been done really well. Sometimes you're lucky and someone like Darby comes on who knows exactly what they're doing. And sometimes it's really like they've never think, thought of it before. Uh, and I see a takeaway about um, pulling people in. Uh, and the question seems attached is how do you get people staying focused on you? And I, and I think like part of what I'm doing here is, you know, I'm looking right at the camera. I am stopping my slides momentarily. Even pausing on the pause slide is a way to pull people back in, Marybeth, because when we're on virtual, and there's no sound for a moment, our brains snap back to that screen because we think maybe something, <laughs> maybe we lost our internet. <laughs> and so that brings people back in. All right, we're gonna just keep going here. Um, a bit more I wanna cover here. So um, let's see, we've got breakout rooms. Now I'm gonna tell you that 
my book is 64,000 words and 10,000 of those are about breakout rooms. So I will just give you a, a little bit of things to think about, but it is the first thing I started writing about for the book because I think there's so much potential and we're really not using it to its fullest extent. One of the questions that I get all the time is how many minutes, and I don't know if you've been part of a Zoom where someone will say, well, let's see how many people are here. Well, how many rooms would that be? Um, carry the one. And I'm like, why are you doing math? Literally, once you start setting up breakout rooms, you toggle up or down the number of rooms and it will tell you in the bottom of the screen how many participants per room. So I think the better question is to come in knowing ahead of time how many participants per room and how many minutes, because it'll be based on your activity, not about how many people are in the room. There are now a hundred rooms available. So unless you've got hundreds of people, you really could do anything you want if you have one, two, 300 people. So there are three types of exercises I'm gonna talk about. There's icebreakers, which are real quick. One of my favorites is um, the uh, the win-win, uh, which is a personal or asking people to share a personal and a professional win, either two people for five minutes or three for six. The difference is if you only have 20 people and you do 10 rooms of two, you can quickly scan to make sure everyone got there. Cause sometimes someone gets hung up on their, their Wi-Fi, and you don't want someone sitting by themselves. If you have more than 10 rooms, they start to collapse and you won't even know that someone's sitting by themselves. So three for six works really well too. And I think it's nice for people to meet a couple people before a session starts. And then uh, having people all share. So we have a very specific question. We have four or five people for 10 minutes. Each of them gets a two minutes to share their answer uh, to a particular question. Maybe you want to have more of a discussion so it's a little less formatted as far as like everyone's going in a circle. Everyone may not have a chance to even speak, but there's a little extra time, uh, up to seven or eight people for up to 15 minutes. When you get into what I call a deep dive, I think having an assigned facilitator and possibly a note taker is really helpful. This is where it's more than 15 minutes. It could be more than seven people. I have organized uh, for uh, one session where people were discussing this national contract and we had CEOs all meeting around different aspects of the contract, 20, 25 people per room for 45 minutes with an assigned facilitator, a note taker. So that's where the deep dive can be really helpful. There are three different styles of breakout rooms. And again, what style you choose should go back to purpose first design. What are you trying to accomplish? So the simplest one is just assign automatically, which you can think in your head, assign randomly. The next is where you're being really specific about the kind of assignment. That's the assigned manual. That's what I did when I was helping people find their way to a very specific room on a very specific topic, one of six with an assigned facilitator. And then lastly, let participants choose room, which done well can lead to a lot of serendipity, which is really cool. People can find the kind of people they want to meet uh, around shared interests, shared identity, shared challenges. I think it's really important for us to find ways to engage participants' brains before we send people into breakout rooms. And one way to do that is to get really clear about the question and to share the question, the individual one question, and give an answer, give an example answer, either yourself or have someone pre-selected to do so. Because their answer is a story and that story makes you think of your own answer, your own story. So that's really important. Now, the, the note here on the screen says not about a current challenge. Uh, I once got assigned to a breakout room, seven people for 15 minutes with three questions. If you're following along from home, that's already too much. First question was share a challenge you're facing. So what happened? The first person who opened up, they got 12 minutes where we help them in a hot seat. And then I noticed there's only three minutes left and we, the six of us got 30 seconds apiece to say hello. So if you really need to talk about challenges, you could frame it differently, share a challenge you've faced and how you overcame it. You might need a little extra time more than maybe, maybe a little more than two minutes, but no one's going to be getting help in that call because it's a past challenge. We hear about common challenges. We hear about some, some resources and we get to witness each other's resilience, which is really cool. The order in which we speak is really a helpful tip. I don't know how many of us have gotten into the breakout room where everyone's muted and we're all like, like we're all being bashful or something. No one knows who should go. Now I've been a little too cutesy about this and I've seen other people get a little too cutesy about this. 
long is the shortest hair. There's always one guy who's bald. We'll talk about that. Um, color of shirt. I once got into a conversation about whether blue or green was darker. Uh, birthdays. I can't even tell you the number of times I've discussed horoscopes in the last three years because the prompt was about birthdays. That had nothing to do with the topic. So my suggestion is you do alpha order, uh, in first name, last name, either alpha or reverse alpha. That's it. If, if you choose uh, to alpha by last name and someone doesn't have a last name showing, hey, you go first, which has actually inspired several people to add their last name in that moment. I also think it's really helpful to use the built-in tools. There's the options when you set up a breakout room. If you haven't explored them, when you go to set up breakout rooms, there's a little gear, a little gear symbol on the bottom left as you're setting up breakout rooms. And when you click on that, you'll see lots of options and it allows you to automatically close the room after X minutes. Well, that's how you get the countdown clock on the top right of your screen in the breakout rooms. And I think knowing you have 10 minutes and seeing that tick down can be very helpful for managing time. Um, what happens after that time runs out is really key. If you didn't have that countdown clock, then I think a minute is good uh, because they had no idea when you were writing these random like four minutes left, two minutes left, like they don't really have any concept of that. But if they're watching that tick down and then you say 60 seconds, it could be a little bit awkward. And if you're not familiar with the term awkward, it's when you're saying an extensive goodbye to someone at a restaurant only to walk in the same direction to your parked cars. That's awkward. And that's kind of what happens when you're saying goodbye and like see back in the main room and then all of a sudden there's 60 seconds, you're like, some people leave, some people are like, is there time for another conversation? I'm, and so I think if you're gonna have the countdown clock, 15 seconds is probably enough time to get people back into the main room. And then we also wanna talk about telling them about how much time they have so that they're kind of prepared for this. And lastly, put the question into chat uh, before the breakout rooms open and that way they'll see it again if you're not seeing chat from the main room and breakout rooms please update your zoom because that was a problem but they've solved for it so you should have a fix if you haven't updated recently uh, that is a fix that's waiting for you debriefs there's so many different debriefs to me a breakout room without a debrief exercise is a really missed opportunity it really is here are a few debriefs that i really like one is nominations in chat. For example, the win-win, the personal professional wins. I love doing nominations afterwards. I do this every week. I run uh, a monthly No More Bad Zoom virtual happy hour for free on the first Friday every month. And I also host a, um, a weekly mastermind as part of the Content and Connection Club, and uh, which is $25 a month. So almost free, half the money goes to charity. Um, but I host this and every week, people always have something to share, but then we have them nominate someone when they get back and what's cool is some brand new people, first timers can get nominated because their, their win was really awesome or compelling. Uh, I also love having people just jot their takeaways and chat when they come back from the breakout rooms then just saying, hey everyone just save chat. This is the quickest debrief. So if you only have a couple of minutes. The waterfall is what I did earlier where I, I stopped the conversation in chat. I really paused it. And what I like about this is that our brains don't have to read other people's answers while we're trying to carefully formulate our own. So it's about, like as analog a moment as you can get in a digital platform, you're like, pause, draft your message, and I'll tell you when to hit enter. And then at all, I mean, I've done this with hundreds of people. It just comes flooding in, which is why I call it the waterfall debrief. Who took notes? There are always some people, maybe some of you who are taking constant notes. Teresa's giving me a thumbs up, right? Some people are just good at that. Well, it, it tends to be the people who are doing the note taking aren't always the ones on the mic, right? Because they're busy taking notes. So you say, hey, who here took lots of notes? You know, you know, some of you just do that. If so, please use the raise hand function under reactions, queue up and give us your top two takeaways. You hear from different people, you hear some great takeaways and we get to honor them for doing that kind of work. Of course, there's always that me, me, me option. Just don't default to letting people self-select by choosing uh, to raise their hand. I am an outgoing extrovert. I don't even know what the question is. I can raise my hand. I'm completely comfortable answering on the fly but that will always preference people like me and leave other people who need a little more processing time out of the picture. So here are some, okay, those are some options. Here's one more note I wanna tell you about breakout rooms. How is 10 minutes actually 17 minutes? Have you ever put a breakout room into your run of show and then you run out of time and your amount of time for your questions at the end gets shrunk down? Cause that's usually what we have to eat up, right? Well, we have 10 minutes, if we have 10 minutes, and beforehand, we have two minutes 
for introducing the topic, for giving an example, for giving the instructions, right? Two minutes plus 10 minutes is 12 minutes. And then you wanna leave five minutes for the debrief. Maybe two minutes if you want something really quick, but that's how we go from 10 to 17. So just kind of think about your timing a little bit. Again, I'm gonna give you a moment to jot down your takeaways and your questions. And I'm gonna look through chat because I know some questions came in. Awesome. So I think that um, what uh, Teresa is referring to, and you can get all of this stuff. I have lots of free content. Uh, it's, a, it's a bonus resource library that goes with the book, Breakout of Boredom. So if you click on breakoutofboredom.com, you'll get access to my No More Bad Zoom settings checklist, which is what Teresa was referring to. I also have a setup uh, guide, which is a step-by-step -step guide that teaches you how to turn on the settings uh, as you're setting up your meeting, 30 plus videos. Um, just, I don't know, I threw, I threw the kitchen sink in. Oh, and uh, another thing I, I show people how to do in the bonus content, but only mention in the book is how to turn this on. And this is a feature from Zoom. This is not through a third-party tool like Ecamm or OBS. I own, <laughs> I own one of these little people who actually use StreamYard laugh at me because they didn't even know they came as small because the people who use StreamYard use these like huge decks. I've never plugged it in. So I, when I say low tech solutions, I'm all about figuring out how to use things that are built into Zoom. All right, we've got a few minutes left here. Let's we'll kind of keep going and I'll check again for questions in a moment. So I'm going to talk about content Q&A and closing remarks as far as like how you're thinking about your session and we'll see what questions are left. So content, there are three forms of content I'm going to talk about. The first is lecture. And again, oh, most people hear lecture and it's like, oh, not another death by PowerPoint. So 10 to 40 minutes, please don't hide behind your slides. I, when I rehearse, I pay attention to how long I'm staying on a slide. And if I'm, I'm on the slide for a while, I mean, it's a gut sense, but if I'm on there for more than 90 seconds, two minutes, I plan to stop my slides. And I don't know if you notice, I'm very, I'm very quick with it. I have a little floating toolbar and I can hit stop share, look at all of you. I hit share screen, I double click on whatever I have open and it pops right back up. I'm not narrating my way. Well, let's see, I hope this works. I'm oh, it's not even open yet. Let me show you my entire desktop. You wanna know how many emails I have? It's 9,000, it's not that important. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is the kind of stuff we do. I, our aim is to get 5% better. Okay, this is what I want for all of you to get 5% better every time you Zoom with your hosting, speaking, or even participating. So pause uh, to capture questions. I think my pause slide and also the you are here slide. Um, uh, the you are here slide is really helpful and uh, leave time for ample time for questions. I'm gonna answer a question just popped in. I did not tell you how to do this, uh, over, this overlay. It's actually a custom video filter. But if you go to breakoutofboredom.com and you look at the PDF that says custom video filter, it'll walk you through how to do it. I will tell you now that it will work if you have a pro account. It will not work if you have a free account. And if you have a enterprise account, it probably will not work for you because it's an enterprise level uh, change. And I cannot imagine anyone running an enterprise wants to have everyone have access to each other's images. So breakoutofboredom.com. Uh, it's one of the reasons I think that having a pro account versus a paid like being a, a member and getting an entrepreneur level, I, I actually don't think the entrepreneur level, the, sorry, the enterprise level is, uh, is actually great uh, unless you're really using all those features. All right, let's talk about fireside chat. Fireside chat is when you don't need a full panel. Please question whether you need a full panel. So many of us default from lecture to panel. Like those are the only two options. So fireside chat is one or two people being interviewed from either 10 to 25 minutes. And on the right side of the screen, it'll show you a few options for why you might wanna have this with one or two people. If you have two people, you can compare and contrast uh, a conversation with a bit of a debate. Uh, maybe you have two people who have a different viewpoints on a story, you wanna get them to share it. A joint effort, like a, a partnership discussion. Maybe you wanna go deeper into one organization's like idea for this topic. My favorite is, this is a great way to support a rookie speaker. 
Many of us here are professional speakers and prepping for a 10 minute talk is not easy. Why do we think that a random member of an association who's a content expert, but not a professional speaker is gonna do a good job when giving a mic for 10 minutes? Better is to plan ahead of time three questions that you will ask them in a fireside chat. And that's your 10 minutes. You can, you can prep with them ahead of time, hone in on exactly what they need, no slides needed, comfortable, right? They get to showcase their, their content expertise. If you are gonna do a panel, please stop doing five, six, seven person panels where every single person has to answer every single question. It's so, ugh, so old. Um, what I want you to do is think about three people for 30 minutes, four people for 40 minutes about that. Uh, moderator should do the introduction. Too often, we are giving the speakers, the panelists, the microphone and saying, please introduce yourself. And then nine, 10 minutes go by when three people introduce themselves. We haven't even gotten to the content. We've already have 10 minutes of them talking about their accolades. If the moderator interviews them ahead of time and does some research, they will answer in 30 to 60 seconds, this two-part question, why should we be listening to this person and what might we learn? That's it. It's a credibility intro. Why might we listen to this person and what might we learn? And then I have this piece on here on the, on the screen around design for interaction. You plan three questions in advance. You get very clear on who the primary answer will come from. Each of them gets one primary answer and one follow-up pre-planned. The primary answer is five minutes. The follow-up is two minutes. If you do the math, this doesn't actually, actually equal 30 minutes. So I'll do the math with you. Five minutes plus two for each question is seven times three is 21. And let's say it's a minute per person intro, that's 24. How do I get to 30 minutes? Well, the moderator gets to riff, <laughs> right? Somebody says something, they know already know a bit about other people, panels, panelists background. They might pull someone else in and maybe they'll take a question from the audience. 30 to 40 minutes, it's gonna be fun and interactive. It looks more like a conversation as opposed to, I have actually seen panelists waiting their turn. <laughs> It's really bad. I've seen people on their phone. I've seen people in person like doodling. I'm, it's hard to stay super focused behind the scenes. All right. I'm going to do another pause here to see as we wrap this up. Okay. Not seeing any major questions come in. I'll take any questions towards the end. Speaking of Q&A, here are some things to do. Focus on generous questions. These are the questions that will positively impact more people if they heard the answer. Sometimes we have these hyper-specific questions that get asked that need a ton of backstory before they even get to the question. If you preference your Q&A by saying, hey, we're gonna be focusing on questions that a lot of people are gonna to wanna to know the answers to. Um, if, you're, if you're wondering about what an acronym is, it would be very generous of you to ask that question because I'm sure someone else was wondering too. And it, you know, my mistake for having not explained it well. If you start getting into a story, I'm gonna politely interrupt and say, let's take this offline. <laughs> I'd rather serve you better by meeting with you one-on-one -on -one to make sure that your organization gets what they need. I also love being able to screen questions via chat. It is so incredible. And by having people write the word question, it not only helps us spot those questions in chat, but it helps them remember to write it as a question. <laughs> It like makes their brain go, oh, right, it's a question. I need to turn this into a question. And I do think having people raise hands is sometimes you want to have them do that and, and use their, their raised hand under reactions. If you open the participant window, you'll see the order that they raise their hands. And I, when I have a bigger group, um, I will ask the host or the chat moderator to copy not just the question, but also who asked it and paste it into a shared Google Doc so that when I'm pausing to take questions, I don't have to scroll through a big, you know, I, I'm asking the right takeaways. Sometimes it's flying by, but I can have those questions and I can prioritize on the fly what questions to ask. And if I don't ask, answer one, I know exactly who asked it and I can do a follow up. I don't know why this happens for virtual events, but so often speakers will say at the end of a presentation, go ahead and unmute. And I want you to think about this in an in-person event. At the end of an event, would you say, oh my God, thank you so much, Teresa, that was amazing. Uh, folks, if you have any questions, just go ahead and start talking. Right? You would say, line up at the microphone, raise your hand, hand in the index card to the person at the end of your row, right? You'd have a plan. And so often what's happening on virtual is there is no plan. So at the very beginning of the event, ideally you tell people how you're gonna handle questions. And at the beginning of the Q&A, you explain it as well. What we wanna do is just stop saying, go ahead and unmute. Because when sometimes people do, it leads to a lot of confusion. 
Um, yes, Harita, <laughs> Harriet asked the question, if you, this has been true all along, Harriet, if you open the participant window, you can see the exact order that people raise their hands. And I like to do something which I call um, on deck where I actually tell people, uh, it'll be like, oh, I see Teresa raised her hand and after that we'll hear from Harriet. So that Harriet's like getting ready on mute as we're wrapping up Teresa. So having that always like the next person on deck for introductions, for questions, it just, it, they're in charge of unmuting, but they need to have, I, in 2020, people would be put in the spotlight and like, <laughs> like I had no idea they were being put in, it was their turn. All right, so now we're gonna get into a couple of thoughts for closing remarks. Uh, if you are the host, being really specific about what the speaker said is just kind of give, I give you bonus points. Like that thing you said is like, it's basically a nice callback, right? I have a three-step process for how, helping people really take action on what they heard. Just to me, I think too often we have what I call entrepreneur TV, where we go to these kinds of workshops and presentations and masterminds and whatever. And like, we just take notes. We just sit there and passively take it in. I want you to take action. So for one, think right now about something you can do, something you learned today that you can do in the next two weeks. Maybe it's you want to go check out your settings. You're going to go to breakoutofboredom.com, download the No More Bad Zoom settings checklist, and you're going to go through your settings and update them, right? Something you can do and then put it on your calendar. So that's calendaring. The next is connecting. That is, well, what can you do to stay in touch with the other people in the community? Maybe stay in touch with me. Stay in touch with you know, the host. Stay, thinking about who else can help you that you've met. And then collaborating. We are not meant to do all this alone. Maybe there's someone you want to meet with as an accountability buddy to get your thing done. Maybe you want to report back to Teresa or me about the results you have. There's two ways I can think of supporting you. One is I have a website and the other is um, these resources, but I'd love to stay in touch. I mean, I've got lots of content I put out on LinkedIn. So I'll put all that in there into chat. And now we're past calendaring, connecting and collaborating. I'm going to share one more poll just to get a quick sense of how people are feeling at the end of this as we wrap this up. And in fact, my next slide is to tell you that it's time for questions. And it says at the bottom of the slide and time to stop sharing your screen. I really don't understand why so many speakers resist this. And as the host, I always tell them if, if your screen goes away, it's because I turned it off. Because when it comes time to Q and A at the end of a session, there's really no reason to have that up. I see that a bunch of you have answered this poll while I'm waiting for a few more of you to answer a two-part question there. I'm just gonna spot through here. Um, so uh, Harriet wants to know how I'm so fast relaunching and stopping my slides. Here's a little secret. If you are a host or co-host and you have the ability to share your screen, all you have to do is hit share screen and then double click on whatever you wanna share. Now, never share your desktop unless you're teaching people how to use Zoom. So somewhere not the top row, but on the row below will be my full screen PowerPoint, in my case, Google Slides. So all I'm doing now, what you probably do is have to find it and hit the submit button or the share button. You don't have to do that. You click share screen and I'll just do it right now, share screen. And then I find it and go, it's on my second row, double click and I'm back in business, right? So you basically practice doing that and <laughs> it make you so much better. All right. Again, we've got 90% in the poll. Wow. I'm seeing the numbers skew much more now towards confident. That's fantastic. We've got uh, six out of nine are feeling really confident with using zoom and they've got some new ideas. looks like you've all skewed up a little bit around facilitation as well. Um, I'm going to quickly share those results and uh, then I'm going to take a peek over here to see if I missed any of these questions. Uh, I see a question about recording. Um, I mean, it depends on whether you're sharing it after, I think, uh, Harriet, you know, and what the community is comfortable with, whether or not you record. And uh, you also can record just for the sake of maybe providing it to the participants and not making it public. Um, you know, you, or you can decide not to record. So, I mean, there's some things I do, I record and some things I, I, I don't record my weekly stuff because I don't think masterminds and breakout rooms make sense as a recording. Like, like it had to be there. I do think as we close, this is what I wanna say, that we need to make a case for live versus replay. I know that we're all used to calling events that happen in person live, but I wanna remind you that we are live right now. 
If I say, Harriet, wave at me, Harriet waves at me and I wave back. That wouldn't happen if we were on a recording. <laughs> okay. So we should remember, and I like to say live online or live virtual gathering. We want people to come ready to participate, camera ready and a space quiet enough to unmute. With that, I'm going to bring Teresa up here to give her closing goodbye. Teresa, thank you for inviting me to participate and be part of your community. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. I took a bunch of notes, cool stuff. Um, so high fives all around. Everybody feel better about Zoom? Yeah, cool tool, cool tool. Saved our butts for a few years, that's for sure, when we couldn't go out and play. Um, I wanna uh, congratulate a participant today who has recently released a book herself. So if we could high five Harriet Stein, whose book has just been released, it is sitting behind her as it should. There it is. Um, congratulations, Harriet. And you know, you'll be part of our club at some point when you're ready in person, virtual, whatever you need. Brilliant. Awesome. Congratulations, Harriet. So that's how we met, by the way. Thank you, Harriet. We met at a NSA Philly breakfast uh, at the beginning of a, of a NSA program day because uh, she was talking about our upcoming book. So oh, can I jump in and just say how valuable this was? Good stuff. Is that okay? Do you, Robbie, is, can, I, can I do that? Sure. Okay. I mean, literally, I've been teaching live over the internet for 20 years that began with a dial-up modem. How many people remember what a dial-up modem was and what it sounds like? I know what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, to, uh, the fact that every time I get on something like this, I don't I don't ever attend a, a program, especially with someone like an expert like you, Robbie, where I'm like, ah, I know it. I can just surf my phone. I knew I would learn stuff today that I have never known and wish I had known for years. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Teresa, for inviting me to be, be here. And I will be uh, heading in uh, on the 3rd to see the, the author, the women's author panel. I know we have one of the authors were here, was here today, Amanda. So super excited to come into Philly for that. Always a great event. Robbie, thank you so, so much. And uh, stay in touch, gang. Stay in touch with Robbie, stay in touch with me and stay in touch with each other because the folks that participate on these programs are awesome as well as the author. So stay in touch. Love you guys, group hug. Thank you, Darby, behind the scenes. Go off, make your day a wonderful one, and we'll meet again. Take care. Thank you, Tate.